you need to be very much aware of what was going on in the assembly of, an, of the early church, especially in the, in the Jewish, among the Jewish Christians who were starting to be persecuted like the, like's discussed in the book of Hebrews. And many of them were leaving New Covenant grace, faith, the faith grace system to go back to the Mosaic law of the Old Covenant system. And he has been trying to remind them of the sternness of the law. Like in verse 10 of James 2, where he reminds you that under the law, if, if, you, if you stumble in one point of the law, you're guilty of the whole shooting match. That's pretty tough. He goes on to tell you that the law is merciless and grace is merciful. And so why would you ever leave grace to go back to the law system when the best it can do for you is to point you to Christ? Because the law is going to condemn you and show you you can't keep it. You can't keep it. And therefore, you become a, tra you become a, a, a transgressor of the law. And uh, it leaves you in quite uh, it leaves you in quite a a difficult place in your life. So along comes God's grace system. Under the new covenant, we are under faith grace rather than works law under the old covenant. So James has been in this discussion, and in the 13th verse, we get into the concept of mercy. And here's how it reads, at least in the, the Bible I have. For judgment will be merciless, See, judgment, law judgment, will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And so he's made a, con he's made a contrast between the two systems, the old law, the old covenant, and the new covenant. So this will be our discussion. We, we talked about this subject last week. We're going to pick up where we left off with four additional ideas on the doctrine of mercy triumphs over judgment. You probably, of all the doctrines that you have in your soul, and, and you have many of them, probably mercy is the least one you think about. And yet, it is one of the key doctrines of the of the attributes of God that's important to your salvation. And by your conduct under grace, it is because of mercy extended through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, that grace is a viable feature of every believer's life. And we talk about the six stages of grace in your life that just dominate you. Saving grace, logistical grace, suffering grace, growing grace, you know, all the way to eternity. This is enormous sin, but listen, it's because of God's mercy, because we're under judgment. Because of Adam's sin, we're all under judgment. Mercy has to deal with it so that grace can operate. Because we're guilty, we're guilty. As, the, as one might say, we're guilty as sin. And uh, so mercy applies the work of Christ on the cross and gives us grace. That's a wonderful feature. Go with me. I'm in James. Go with me back up to Hebrews 10 and look at verse 1. It's just a couple pages back. Listen to what he says. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifice year after year which they offer continually, make perfect those who draw near. It wasn't intended to save you. It was intended to remind you that a Savior was coming that would save you. And so they did it every year, every year looking for the what? The coming of Christ. They looked every year to remind the people that when Christ would come, he would fulfill this enormous promise. 
he would complete it. Write this down in your paper because you're not getting it. So maybe it'll come later. Write down Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. In Hebrews 11th chapter, verses 39 and 40, the writer summarizes what he's been talking about. All these, and all of these, talking about all the people mentioned in Hebrews 11, having gained approval through their faith, did not, and he's talking about the old covenant, did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us, new covenant believers, so that apart from us, new covenant believers, they should not be made perfect. That they should, that they should, have not, that they should not be perfect. In other words, when Christ would come, when Christ would come into the world, listen to me now, his blood was superior because the blood on the, went over the mercy seat every year was shadow Christology. It, wasn't the, it was a shadow. What is the substance of a shadow, right? Right? It is Jesus Christ. That's, that's the whole story of the book of, of Hebrews. It's Jesus Christ. The, 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 it's, if you're talking about blood, then it's the blood of Jesus Christ. And so... They did this. They offered animal, that, which was called covenant blood, until Christ would come and offer the completion of the covenant blood. When he did, then the rest of it's been what? Fulfilled. Do you understand? Because they looked for the coming of Christ that would fulfill it. In other words, when they did this stuff in the Old Testament, they did this in view of Christ's coming. <laughs> That's Old Covenant. They look for Christ to come the first time. When we take part in Eucharist, as we will do today, we look the same way. We look for Christ to come a second time, not in regard to sin, but in deliverance of the church. That's Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 28 which we've been studying on Tuesday and Wednesday. Now we're brought down to look at the idea of mercy. It's called the mercy seat. It was on the mercy seat that the blood, the mercy seat, it's what it covered that was important to them. When Christ comes along and on the cross sheds his blood, that is the blood that this is a shadow, that's the blood of the substance, that's what it looked forward to, that's what it pointed towards, when it comes, it completes the whole thing and moves us into a whole other ball game called the Messianic period, the consummation of the ages, the reformation of Messianic teaching. <laughs> In 2 Peter, the third chapter, verse 16, he says, listen, you got to put your thinking cap on. This is not for the faint of heart. If, you, if you're looking for yeah, 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 give me a J, give me an E, give me an N, you're in the wrong church today. You, this is where you've got to stop and think a little bit. And if you don't have doctrine, this is a building. If you do have doctrine, this is an explanation. This is bringing pieces together. And so you've really got to understand this stuff. The mercy seat. We're talking about the mercy seat. In Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 22, they're, well, quote, if you have a study by they're quoting Leviticus 17, 11. Uh, they're, 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 they're explaining the concept in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 22. And it says, according to the law, one may almost always say all things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. But you see, the blood that went over the mercy seat pointed to the coming of Christ who would fulfill that whole concept. We live in the day of that fulfilled concept. Christ is not going to come back and die a second time for your sins. Therefore, when you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, when you believe that, you are now entered into eternal salvation. The Bible in Hebrews 
the eighth and ninth chapter, the writer talks about your internal, your eternal inheritance in Christ. And you don't get saved one day and lost the next. If you did, then Christ would have to come a second time take care of that. But he died one death, Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. He died one death for all time. It's not a matter, it's not a matter that you've committed sin and become carnal, that you've got to be saved again. The issue is you've got to confess your sin and begin to live for Christ. Stop living for yourself. Sin is a gratification of your own needs that God would meet another way and would meet it completely instead of temporal. He'll meet your needs. He will meet your... Philippians 4.19, will he not meet your needs? It's a promise. How come you think, well, that applies to my life financially and career, but not to my romance? How is that possible? He takes care of all your needs, and he takes care of it in a proper way. Stop looking for improper ways to meet the need that only God can meet in your life. person told me the other day, you know, Ron, I'm yada yada age, and the only thing I ever wanted in this life was to be loved. I said, well, how's that possible that you've not found that? Well, I've been through so many relationships that I've just done with them. Oh, I said, well, that's your problem. You've looked, the wrong, you've looked in the wrong places for it. See, it's not, that, it's, not that, it's not that dating and looking is in the proper. It's, it's it, your heart's wrong. You're looking at all the wrong places to get the one thing that only God can give you. When you get that right, when you get the love of God right in your heart, instead of all this foolishness, heart, love ideas that come out of Hollywood, when you get the stuff that comes out of the Bible about the love of God in your heart and how that develops, when you learn your love relationship with God, then you've got something to offer other people. Otherwise, it's all conditional. And that's why you have been through so many relationships. You don't have to go through all those relationships. You learn nothing but pain. Tell me you, you've learned something more than pain. That's not the love of God. It's not a painful relationship with God. Love is not painful with God. It's unconditional. We think it's conditional and we take it to other people. Love between you and God is not conditional unless, unless it's from you to him. Here's a person that stopped on romance and she doesn't realize it comes from God. You, you want real romance in your life? Fall in love with God. You will never know it until you know that. Do you don't know what you're looking for. You know, it's a, a straw in a haystack. You don't have to come up with your own program. <coughs> program. You know what you do? You take a program, then you try to program the person they don't work because all of a sudden he, he finds out, oh, wait, I don't want this anymore. Program. Can't program. Well, anyhow, apparently that was for somebody. I don't know. Mercy seat. The mercy seat out of Leviticus, Leviticus 16 and 17. In Hebrews, the seventh chapter, 26 through 28. It says, Jesus Christ offered up himself once for all. Now that once for all is kind of interesting. Once for all time, yeah. Once for all people, yeah. Once for all. You can just about put anything in there you want. it answer it. I find that interesting as well. In, in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, 7 through 15, in verse 10 he says, in reference to the law, <laughs> the writer says, he says, the law relates only to, listen to this, 
food, drink, and washings. And he's talking about the law. Regulations, watch this now, regulations for the body until a time of reformation. You know what that is? That's the coming of Christ. When the shadow becomes the, when the substance becomes the shadow. Or the shadow becomes the substance. Right? In Hebrews 9.26, he called that the reformation idea in 10, he calls the consummation of the ages, the coming of Christ. Are you getting into this? I don't see you writing much. I don't see it. You're a lot smarter than I was because I had to write a lot. Listen to this, Hebrews 9.15. Listen to this one. For this reason, he is a mediator of the new covenant. A mediator of what? A new covenant. Listen, to have a mediator, he must be something over here and something over here. I'm a mediator, right? There's something over here and there's something over here. He says, I'm a mediator of the new covenant. Therefore, what, what, what's he mediating? He's mediating the old covenant out and the new covenant in. Come on now. He's mediating the old covenant out and the new covenant in. Oh, you need to read. Oh, my goodness. You have, risked, you have missed, really, a rich study that we've had in Hebrews 9, 8, 9, and 10. We've covered all of this. We have covered all this. You, of course, it's online, thank to John Dyer, so you can pick it up anytime you want to study it. For this reason, he's a mediator of a new covenant so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. You know how to get it? You've got to go to the mediator of the new covenant to get it. If you, go to the new, if you go to the mediator of the new covenant, which is Jesus Christ dying on the cross, being buried and raised from the dead the third day called the gospel, when you believe it, you get it. Not only do you get salvation, but listen, you get the promise of an eternal inheritance. That's what you're missing in your daily living. You're looking for all the wrong things in all the wrong places when you ought to be looking for the right things in the right places. You have an eternal inheritance. Listen, God will fill your cup until it what? Overflows. How is it possible that that's not happening in your life today? This young lady, I said, how is it possible that your cup is not being over, overflowed? Because she felt like it was empty. She refers to her life as empty. How, your, how can your life be empty when God has filled your cup and will fill it overflowing? Because you're not looking for it. You're not paying any attention to that. You're looking to the world to meet your needs when Christ has already got them covered. And he will fulfill your life. He will bring your life to such a place. But listen, you got to quit focusing on me, 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 me. you got to start focusing on him, 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 him. You need to come out of this muck and mire of the world. You're the one who puts yourself in there, prodigal child. Nobody puts you in the pig pen. Nobody put you in a place of despair. Nobody put you there. God certainly didn't. What he wants you to do is come home, get cleaned up, and get back into the program properly. That's the story of the prodigal son, isn't it? Could be a prodigal daughter, as I said to this young lady the other day. Look it. You've got to quit going to the world, listening to the world, give you advice. Why don't you study the Word of God? Why don't you sell out to God and then let Him give you all the things He's promised from eternity past to your life? The last person God ever wants to be miserable is us who represent Him on earth. Our joy should be so full that it's overflowing. People meet us, they meet joy. Don't you hate to go to a a restaurant where everybody's having a bad day. You walked in there to get away from it, right? I can't stand that. I was in one the other day, 
This person came up and just had an attitude with me. I said, look, before you take my order, we're going to have a word of prayer. <laughs> and he said, sir, I said, listen, if the food is as bad as your attitude, I'm not going to eat here. I said, you know what? I come in here and I pay. And I'm willing to tip to somebody who's got a good attitude. I came in here. Listen, you think you got a bad day? I came here to get out of one, not to jump in one. So you got two choices, bud. You can clean up your act and get a tip, or you can give me another waiter. Because I'm thinking I don't want to eat here. If the food is as bad, if, you, if the cook in the kitchen's like you, I ain't going to eat. I think as you get older, you get away with that stuff. <laughs> so he looked at me a pretty good while. And I thought, well, this will be interesting. And he said, I apologize. I apologize. It was wrong for me to have that. I said, okay. When you bring me my food, it's going to be top of the line, ain't it, buddy? Yep. Okay. And I'm going to have a prayer. I pray over my food. I'm a believer. But I want good service. I pay for it. I want good food. And I want good service. I could stay home and cook, you know, fix me a peanut butter jelly sandwich. So I'm trying to step out of my little world into a, a place that I feel I can come and be king for the day. So I'm going to pray for that for you and me. And I hope I haven't offended you, but I came here for good service and good food. I expect it. So I just wanted you to know my opinion. Well, he came back, had a pretty good attitude. And then I had an opportunity as he came and filled my coffee and did other things to talk to him about how important Christ is in his life to change his day. Now, he might have thought, it'd be good if you take your own advice. <laughs> I wasn't trying to be mean to him. That wasn't my intention. My intention was to do the reason I walked in there. I should get good service, and I should get good food. Nobody's given it to me. And if I can't get it there, I need to go to someplace else where I could get it, or else go home. I know I can get it there. I can do it to myself. How do you like that, Ron? It's pretty good. <laughs> you going to leave a tip? Yeah, sure it will. The mercy seat covered the law. Watch this principle. The mercy seat covered the law. Therefore, it covered the justice and judgment of God for sin. When you look at each of the things that's under the mercy seat and under the blood, you will find a wonderful story of redemption. You'll find a wonderful story of redemption. Therefore, the blood, the covenant blood, covered the justice and judgment of God for sin. Therefore, the old covenant shadow Christology, blood poured over the mercy seat, covered temporarily, because they had to do it every year, everything in the Ark of the Covenant. Everything. Listen, even the holies of holies. You know what the holy of holies represents in the new covenant? That's a shadow of, you know what, you know what the shadow, substance of the shadow is in the New Testament, under the new covenant? Your body. The believer's body. 1 Corinthians 16, 19, and 20. What, don't you know that your bodies become the naos, the holies of holies? You see what the blood of Christ can do for you? We are the temple of God. We are the temple of God because of the blood of Christ that made it possible. It's the blood on the inside that makes it the holies of holies. Whoa. It wasn't the blood on the outside, the blood on the inside. The atoning work. What a wonderful idea it is for us. The old covenant the old covenant pointed to the coming of Christ who would fulfill. Matthew 5.17, Jesus said, I, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. In Romans 4, 10, chapter verse 4, Christ is the end of the law. Luke 24.44, all things written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms 
That's the whole old, that's the whole shoot match of the old covenant might be fulfilled. Galatians, the third chapter, verse 24. The law became our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we might be justified by faith. We've got, and what, it seems like I've been preaching longer than this. What time is it? How much? Okay. Well, apparently not. 10, 13, I got a little more than. Point two, I don't know, for some reason, somebody I've been preaching a long time now, and it's just. <laughs> Al says it seems like a long time to him, too. Just remember, you can be replaced. Just remember that. Uh, but here is what's important to understand about the book of James and the book of Hebrews that covers this same subject. Here's what they both declare. The new covenant is superior in every way to the old covenant. Why would you ever go back to the law system? My, 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 why would you ever do that? For no reason, I hope. Listen, you know what God really desires between us, between him and, and a believer? You know what he really desires? I mean, there are a lot of things I suppose we could think right now. So let me just cut to the chase with you. Worship. And I'll tell you why that's important. In the, the great conflict between Satan and Jesus before he jumps into his full-blown ministry to go to the cross, in Matthew, the fourth chapter, 1 through 11, the whole deal between him and Satan was to get, get Jesus to worship Satan. Because, you see, worship is the number, number one deal of the game. Worship. In Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 20 says, it says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some. And be alert more as the day is approaching. Forsake not these. You know what it's all about? You know what this assembling is all about? There are a lot of different avenues. There are a lot of different reasons we assemble, and rightly so. But you know what the primary reason is? Worship. Now, how do we do that? John 4, 24. You want to worship God? Here's how you do it. You worship him in your spirit by truth. Jesus said, you will know the truth. If you study the word of God, you will know the truth. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. You will know the truth, and truth of what? Sets you free. All this goofiness, like this young lady, all this goofiness over here from the world, sets you free from it. Sets you free. Sets you free. And when, when you get set free in God, then God's going to begin to do for, things for you. He will do things for you that only Hallmark could do a movie on. Only Hallmark. What a brush of air that, that program is amidst all the muck and mire of the rest of the television. At least we get a happy ending, don't we? I mean, who doesn't watch it for the kiss? I mean, even I do. Let's have that big da 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 da. I love those happy endings. About time. Listen to this. I just wrote a few things down here. Later, you can go back and look at them. Old Testament was shadow of Christ, not the substance of Christ, like in Hebrews 10:1. In Hebrews, the seventh chapter, 22. I just picked out stuff that most of the people in here be familiar with that we've studied. In Hebrews, the 10th chapter, 22, the New Testament, he says the New Testament is a better covenant in Christ. You know what he calls it? Guaranteed. <laughs> I love that. I mean, who doesn't like guarantees? It says the New Covenant, it's a better covenant because of the guarantee that comes with Christ, because of Jesus Christ. In the 8th chapter, verse 6, he calls it a better covenant, makes it superior. That's in Hebrews 8. Six. In, ver in verse 13 of the 8th chapter, he says that the first covenant was obsolete, ready to disappear with the coming of Christ. Obsolete. Who would go back to something that's obsolete? I mean, we don't even like anything that's obsolete, do we? 
Well, that's his grandpa or grandma. I hope that's fair game, yeah? In Hebrews, the ninth chapter, 14 and 15, he says the first covenant, the blood of the first covenant was for outward cleansing. Watch this now. And the blood of the new covenant is for inward cleansing. <laughs> See, if you just knew that, you wouldn't go back to the old covenant. You wouldn't go back to a law system. It only works the outside, never works the inside. Jesus said it in Matthew 23 when he went through the seven woes. In Matthew 23, he went through seven woes of going back to the law. Come out of the law into Christ. <laughs> in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 9 and 10, Jesus set aside the first covenant covenant in order to establish the second. There, all of these are listed on your paper. Also in Hebrews 8 chapter verse 7, it says the first covenant was faulty and the second covenant is faultless. You know what the Greek word means there? The Greek word means without blame, without legal fault, without legal blame. Now in closing, Hebrews 8 through 10 teaches, teach that the new covenant blood of Jesus Christ covered the mercy seat, covered the ark of the covenant, covered the Mosaic law, all the old covenant, as well, listen, as well as the sins of the entire world. Because you see, with the mercy seat only worked for the priest nation of Israel. But the blood of Christ from the cross works for the sins of the world. Whoa. How good is it set under that flag, Horton? What a great flag that is to set under. 1 John 2, 2. Jesus Christ on the cross is a propitiation for our sins and not only for ours, sins of the whole world. You know what the difference in that in theology? The difference is unlimited atonement to a limited atonement. Not for our sins only, that's limited atonement, but for the sins of the entire world, that's unlimited atonement, unmistakable in the word of God. You can't, I can't begin to tell you how many preachers don't, don't get that. They, t they teach craziness. There's a verse that lays it out as clear as it could get. Not for our sins only, but for the sins of the entire world. To everyone who would believe. John 1, 11 through 13, I came to my own and the own received me not, but as many as believe in me become sons of God. But as many as. Thank God for the many as. That's unlimited atonement that offers it to you and I. Jesus taught this. Listen, here, here is something in 1 Peter 2.10. He, Peter says, for you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You, have not re you had not received mercy, but now, but now. See, the, the, to, look, look, you're missing something. He said that, but now twice. Those are markers. You pay attention to markers. But now. You were not a people, but now you are a people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You know what he's quoting, if you have a study Bible? Hosea. Hosea 1, 6 and 9. You know what he was speaking to? The Jews. You know what's interesting? In Romans, the ninth chapter, verses 24 through 26, he quotes Hosea again. Paul this time quotes him. And he's referring to Gentiles. He uses the same text, but he's talking to, to Gentiles. In 1 Peter 2.10, connected with Galatians 3.28, he's talking to both of them. You see, when Hosea, when Hosea 1, 6, and 9, Hosea 1, 6, and 9 is talking Jews exclusively. When Paul talks about it in Romans, the ninth chapter, he's talking to Gentiles exclusively. He tells you that. They both tell you that. But when Peter 
talks in 1 Peter 2.10 and quotes this Hosea passage. He's referring to both of them. Because of Galatians 3.23, we are no longer Jews, we are no longer Gentiles, we are what? One in Christ. See, what is the difference there? I'll tell you the difference there. In the, in the parable of the tenant that we talked about here recently in Matthew 21, 33 through 34, we're told in verse 41 and 43, Jesus said that God is going to take the kingdom of God away from you and is going to give it to a people who will produce the kingdom's fruit. You know what he's talking about? He was talking about he's going to give it to those people, whether Jew or Gentile, who come to faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Christ came into the world to die for your sins, to be buried and be raised from the dead, to give you life everlasting, to bring you into the family of God, because he believes that you and I will produce the fruit of the kingdom. I hope that's true for you. I, know, I hope it's true for me. It's my passion. It's my passion. It's my passion. In Acts, the 13th chapter, 46 through 48, and the 18th chapter, verse 6, he announces it again. He announces it. Paul says, Paul says, your blood be on your head to the Jew. Your blood be upon your head to the Jew. I am clean from you from this day forward, I go to the Gentiles who are wide open, who have positive volition for the truth of the word of God. I'm stopped, I'm stopped teaching a bunch of people who don't want to hear it. I'm tired of that. I am leaving this group of people who don't want the truth of the word of God to go to a people who do. And there's the message for us in the church. There's the message for us in the church. Always looking for those who have positive listen to the truth of God, who want God to do a life-changing work in them, and God is more than willing to do it. God is more than willing to do it if you're open for it. And your heart should be. God's saving mercy was transferred from the old covenant mercy seat to the new covenant mercy seat of Christ on the cross. Ephesians 2, 4, and 6. But God being rich, circle that. In what? Rich. That, that, listen, we might call that stinking, stinking rich. Rich in mercy. Let me tell you, if he's, if he's rich in mercy, he's more than rich in grace. God being rich in mercy, you want, listen, write this passage down. This is what rich in mercy means. Write down Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse 16. That clock has stopped on a wall. I mean, that clock stopped. What, what time is it? What? Let me read 4.16. Then we've we got to wrap this. That clock stopped. I kept thinking, that clock's been there for a long time. I know. Here's Hebrews 4, 16. This is what, listen, this is why, listen, God is rich in mercy whether you understand or not. Agreed? Right? This is a principle of God. Listen to this. Let it, this is from the new, uh, the NIV. Let us approach the throne of grace with what? Confidence. With boldness. Confidence. Confidence. You know where confidence comes to do that? Out of the word of God. Spiritual growth in your soul. It's only where it comes from. Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may, watch this, why do we do that with confidence? So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help who? Us in our time of need. Isn't that wonderful? And will he ever run out of, uh, out of mercy to give you? Will he ever run out of grace to give you? Will he ever run out feeling the need? Listen, God feels your need. You don't have to bark at him all the time about it. Listen to me. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That's God's compassion towards us. 
He likes you to state it, but he, he well understood it. I mean, he understood the need the prodigal had before the prodigal went, I'm just sick and tired of this. My life just sucks. Right? God went, I like that. That's a tough confession, but I like that. But he, God saw that need before the man saw it, but when he saw it, it thrilled God that he saw it. Do you see that? And so God starts on his walkout, right? He walking out to meet him. The Bible calls it that young man, that young person came to his senses. And so there we have it. One final point is that Psalms 23. It's a little homework for you. A little, little home study. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. Ah, uh, really? Is the Lord really your shepherd? Oh, I know. You go, yeah, 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 yeah. I know that. So I'm going to give you a test. It's in there. There's only six verses in that Psalms. There's only six verses. And the last one is a conclusion. In ten verses, in five verses, he gives you ten clues to test yourself whether the Lord is your shepherd. There are ten. There, it's a little test. The Lord is my shepherd. Oh, yeah? Well, here's a test. There are ten. In five verses, there are ten, ten, there are ten points. Check them off. And then read the conclusion. Check them off. See if the Lord is your shepherd. That whole Psalms will become a new Psalms in your life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me, what? All the days of my life. That's how you know the Lord is your shepherd. But she got 10 points to see if you can get there. There are ten point te there's a 10-point test in there to see if you can get there. Because that, that's, the, that's the bottom line. I'm a bottom line guy. That's the bottom line. Will follow me all the days of my life, and when my life is over, I will dwell in the house of God forever. -ah. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful today for this message. I pray, Father, the strength of the truth of it would touch our hearts in such a way that our lives would be transformed. We're always in a stage of transformation if we've become serious about worship through the Word of God in the power of the Holy Spirit. There'd be new covenant believers. I pray, Father, this is not a sermon you hear one time and leave. This is a sermon that stays with you until you get it. That's my prayer as I prepared it. As I delivered, I prayed that it's a seed that would grow in to a productive life of fellowship with you, Father, including my own. I pray for the offering that we're about to give based on motive, not on law, but the inner thinking of the heart and our relationship with God. We give to missions. We give to ministry. We give to needs. We give as God leads us. We receive it, Father, and determine how it should be spent in the greatest of needs as a church. But we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.